14, verse 22. All right. And as they were eating, he took bread. Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Um, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said empathetically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same.
continue the story in Mark 14 with Peter's insistence. Peter emphatically said, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others were in agreement. They went to a place called Gethsemane, Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping. Because their eyes were heavy, they did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Thus far the pro proclamation of God's word. Please be seated. I'd ask those who are going to uh, help serve communion today to come and be seated here at the front. We're going to do communion a little bit differently today. We're going to pass the bread and the juice together down the row, so please just be extra careful as you pass uh, the plate for one and then the container for the other back and forth, and then we'll all hold the elements and then partake of them together. We've read uh, basically what's called in liturgical terms the Monday Thursday story, the Holy Thursday, the Thursday night before the Friday trial and crucifixion. We've been reading that story and in its context, the story of that Passover night, which has become for us the Lord's Supper. And I wanted to reflect back for us on a different passage where Jesus speaks about bread and himself again in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verse 32, we read, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The disciples said, Sir, from now on, give us this bread. Verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I've told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen? It's interesting how years before he would share that last meal with his disciples, Jesus combines together what we would call this communion imagery of Christ as the bread of life together with an understanding of what went on in Gethsemane, that his will was to do his Father's will. Together with that Easter, the resurrection theme, that Christ who is raised from the dead will one day come again to raise each of us from the dead and to take us to be with him forever. And so when we celebrate communion, we certainly celebrate Good Friday we look forward to Easter Sunday, but then we also look forward to that great day. Jesus says elsewhere that he won't partake of this table again until he gets a chance to partake of it with us 
together at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And so this table, it's a table of mourning, for sure. The elements represent the sacrifice that Christ made for each of us. It's a table of hope because of what those elements purchased for us, the eternal life and hope of resurrection, but it's also a table of prophecy, a table of expectation as we look forward to sharing it together with our Lord again one day. Well, let me pray, and then we will uh, distribute and partake of the elements together. Let us pray. Lamb of God, who was pierced for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, on whom the punishment that brings us peace was laid upon. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who came not to do his own will, but the will of him who sent him. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away my sin, who takes away our sins. Lamb of God, have mercy on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Of what we would call two hills, but what in Middle Eastern terms they call two mountains. Uh, the Mount of Olives is the eastmost mountain of three mountains that make up the city of Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives, Mount Moriah, and then what's become known as Mount Zion. And on the back side of the Mount of Olives is Mary and Martha's house where Lazarus was raised in the little village of Bethany and the other village there of Bethpage. And you come over the crest of the mountain and you see the city of Jerusalem. It glows golden in the sun because of the stones it's built of. The sun rises up behind you. And you go down that mountain and as you climb down that mountain, even today, uh, there is at the foot, of course, um, They've newly planted, meaning in the last four or five hundred years, uh, an olive grove there. And in Jesus' day, the whole side of the mountain between the little towns of Bethany and Bethpage, and down the side it was an all an olive grove. Today it's mostly a cemetery, actually, but in those days it was all uh, an olive grove. It would caught the afternoon sun and would grow there. And at the bottom, there was a, uh, an olive press where the Olives would be brought and olive oil would be created and then sold and distributed. And after having his last supper over on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, Jesus has walked through the temple precincts or perhaps around them. He's come out the eastern gate which faces the Mount of Olives and he's walked down the other side of the Kidron Valley and has gone into this garden to pray with his disciples. And it's there in Mark 14, 36, that Jesus, interestingly enough, takes the three Galilean co-workers. He takes Simon, James, and John. And he goes a little bit further in to pray for what he's about to face. His betrayal, his arrest, his crucifixion. And it's interesting that only in Mark's gospel do we read in in Mark 14, 36, only Mark captures this little detail I want us to look at this morning. And the detail is this Aramaic word, Abba. Now, church tradition tells us that late in his life, Peter is in the city of Rome, and he's going to be martyred under Nero. And John Mark has gone there previous to all this, perhaps with the Apostle Paul. We're not exactly sure how, but John Mark, the writer of this gospel, has gone there and is in Rome with Peter. And John Mark is sent, or he goes, or under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, or maybe this was his job, whatever it was. Church tradition tells us that Simon, 
who's traveled all over the world and suffered all kinds of things for Christ and has been part of planting churches and doing all these amazing things. Simon, at the end of his life, sits down with this middle-aged man at this point, but who was a young man in the days of these events, John Mark, and recounts his version of the Jesus story. And Jesus and Simon grew up in the same uh, basic sort of region. They grew up in the same province, as it were. They both grew up in Galilee. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, up in the hill country. Simon and James and John, they grew up along the, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus is from the hill country. These guys are fishermen raised on the lake shore there in Galilee. But they, all four of them, spoke Aramaic as their first language. They didn't speak Hebrew as their first language. That's the religious language of the synagogue and of the temple. They didn't speak Greek as their first language. That was the language of business when you went to market to sell your fish. If you were Simon, James, or John, or if you went uh, to, along with your father like Jesus would have to, to barter on building a house for someone, which is what Joseph was. He was a technon, a home builder. Then you would talk in Greek. But the language you learned at home the first words you heard were in Aramaic. And so here, at the end of his life, in this garden with, with the soldiers coming and Judas about to make good on his threats to betray Jesus, the 30 pieces of silver already having been paid, Jesus calls these three guys who he knows best he needs them. And he goes a little bit further on in the garden, a little bit deeper in. Another one of the versions of this story says that Christ prayed so hard, he was so distressed, he was sweating blood. And it's there that Jesus doesn't speak to his father in the language of the marketplace. He doesn't speak to his father in the language of the temple. No, it's there, the very human Jesus cries out to his dad in the language of his nursery, in his language of his childhood, in the language of his home. And he cries out to his father and he says, Abba. You know, you've been, most of you have heard more sermons than is legally allowable in 12 states. You know that that's the Aramaic word meaning daddy. It was one of the first words a young, the young boy Jesus would have probably learned. And there in that garden, he cries out to his father, Abba, Father. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And it's only in Mark's gospel, only in Peter's recollection. This same event happens in the other three synoptic, in the other gospels. Matthew records this event, there's no Abba. Luke records this event, there's no Abba. It's only in Simon's recollection. Simon, who would have heard that word as he began to fall asleep, he would have heard Jesus crying out to his father in the language of Simon's childhood. And Simon, as an old man, about to die, recounting his darkest night, the night where he would not betray his Lord, but he would desert him. That old man, Simon, remembers that Jesus and he shared a language and remembers that in his darkest hour, our Lord cried out to his father, saying, Daddy, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Are you in a Gethsemane this morning? Are you being pressed down? Maybe it's your finances. Maybe your spouse and you are here today and it looks good. Everybody got dressed and everybody got here more or less on time and you're going to have sticky buns later but you haven't spoken to one another in 
days. Maybe that's your Gethsemane this morning. Maybe you're here in a Gethsemane today. And last year your son or daughter was here, but this year they aren't. Something's happened. You can't put your finger on it, but you're in your Gethsemane today. You feel, you feel the pressure. I want you to know that for Jesus and for you and I, that in our Gethsemanes, God is still our Abba. It's so powerful to me that this is what Simon would remember, that this is what the Spirit would inspire, that this is what our Lord would say, that here in the garden, knowing what his Father was about to put him through, Jesus Jesus knew, Jesus way back in Mark 8, years before these events, we record, and Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. Jesus knew what was before him. He knew in a sense what his Abba was about to put him through. But he still calls out to him. Because his father is still his Abba. The one who loves him and protects him. Despite what he's about to go through. A little quirk of sort of Jewish family law in Jesus' day, was that if you were a Jewish person in Jesus' day and you owned slaves, then those slaves could call the head of the household pater, father. But only the children could call the father Abba. A slave was not allowed to call the father Abba. Why? Because they were a slave, not a son. And so of all the things that I could say to you today, if you're in a Gethsemane, if you're being pressed down, if you're being poured out, is I want you to remember that even in Gethsemane, God is still your Abba. That the God who protected Jesus when his family had to flee down to Egypt, that the God who in in Luke chapter 3, 22, when Jesus is baptized, rings out, resounds out from the heavens, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. That the God who has given Jesus all of these incredible mountaintop experiences, these healings, he's just raised Lazarus from the dead. That the God who was with Jesus and who is with you through the Amazing experiences of your life when you're in a Gethsemane. That God is still your Abba. He still cares for you deeply. Despite whatever cup you may be having to drink. And so by calling God his Abba, what was Jesus saying? He was saying that my father is caring for me now like he is always cared for me. And if you're here today and you're going through your own Gethsemane, I want you to know and do the same. We often will let trials drive us from the Lord. But I want you to know that for Jesus and certainly for his interpreters and the people who read these Gospels carefully, they find that in these moments here in Gethsemane, that in many, many ways, the Father is never closer to Jesus than he is right now. And so if you're in a garden, but more importantly, in a press, if you're in a Gethsemane today, I want you to know, God is still your Abba. Let's pray together. Abba Father, it's not so very long from these events where we'll read and we saw portrayed in that 
short little movie earlier that Jesus would cry out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Lord, we're thankful that Jesus cried that out on our behalf, that none of us here will ever have to experience on the cross or experience in life what he experienced on the cross, that none of us will ever have to experience that utter aloneness where you, his Abba, as the scripture said, Jesus became sin for us there on the cross in order that we might become your righteousness, Lord God. And so we're thankful, Heavenly Father, that today we know you as our Abba because Jesus hung on the tree for each of us. In his name I pray. Amen.